the alarm blared, jolting me awake. 6.30 a.m. I groaned, my head pounding from the relentless dreams that had plagued me all night. The same nightmare, over and over, being chased through a dark, endless maze by some unseen terror. I dragged myself out of bed and stumbled to the bathroom, splashing cold water on my haggard face. As I stared at my reflection in the mirror, I couldn't shake the eerie feeling that something wasn't right, but I dismissed it as lingering unease from the nightmare. I threw on my usual button-down shirt and slacks, barely registering the motions. My mind was already racing ahead to the day of meetings and project deadlines awaiting me at the office. Being a senior financial analyst at a major bank meant high pressure and long hours, but the six-figure salary made the stress worth it, usually. I hurried out to my car, a sleek black BMW, my most prized possession. I turned the key in the ignition. Nothing. I tried again. Still nothing. Not even a sputter. No, 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 I muttered. Not today. After several more futile attempts, I slammed my hands against the steering wheel in frustration. I'd have to call a lift and be late to my first meeting. My boss hated tardiness. Forty-five minutes later, I rushed into the office, my Starbucks sloshing onto my hand. I cursed under my breath and took the stairs two at a time up to the tenth floor. I barged into the conference room. Sorry I'm late, car trouble, I said breathlessly. My boss Mark glared at me, his jaw clenched. The client sitting around the table looked annoyed. Have a seat, James, Mark said icily. I trust you can get up to speed quickly. Face burning, I slunk to my chair and flipped open my laptop. The screen remained black. I jabbed at the power button repeatedly, panic rising in my throat. Is there a problem? Mark asked pointedly. Um, just one moment. I fumbled in my bag for my power cord with shaking hands. My laptop had crashed. Along with all the files I needed for my presentation, which I of course hadn't backed up. The rest of the day only got worse. I finally made it back to my apartment that evening, completely drained. All I wanted was to pour a stiff drink and collapse in front of the TV. As I put my key in the lock, I noticed the door was already slightly ajar. That was odd. I was sure I had locked up this morning, even in my rush. Pulse quickening, I cautiously pushed the door open. Everything seemed in place in the entryway. I must have just been careless in my haste to leave. I fixed myself a whiskey on the rocks and sank onto the couch. I switched on the TV. Static. I flipped through the channels, but none of them had a signal. Stupid cable, I grumbled. One more annoyance to cap off a miserable day. I picked up one of the true crime novels stacked on my coffee table, my preferred form of escape. I thumbed it open to my bookmark. The pages were blank. Confused, I flipped through the book. Every single page was empty. An uneasy shiver ran through me. This made no sense. Disturbed, I tossed the book aside and headed to bed, hoping desperately tomorrow would be better. I was back in the maze. The darkness pressed in around me as I moved through the narrow, winding passageways. My ragged breathing echoed off the close walls. Something was in here with me. I could feel it. Some malevolent presence watching, waiting. I pushed myself to run faster, rounding turn after turn, but the maze never ended. Fear froze my insides. It was getting closer. I could hear it slithering and scraping along the stone. I couldn't run anymore. I knew it was useless. Gasping, I jerked upright in bed, sweat drenching my t-shirt. The digital clock on my nightstand read 3.33 a.m., the devil's hour. My whole body trembled. That nightmare had been even more vivid and terrifying than before. It had felt so real, the powerlessness, the all-consuming dread. Still shaking, I stumbled to the bathroom for a glass of water. I froze. There, in the center of the fogged up mirror, was a handprint, as if someone had pressed their palm against the glass from the other side. I backed away, my heart pounding wildly. Someone was in my apartment, or had been while I was sleeping. Panicked, I grabbed the baseball bat I kept under my bed and searched the entire place. Every room was empty. I was alone. But I couldn't shake the overwhelming feeling that I wasn't that I was being watched by unseen eyes, maybe even hunted. Over the next few days, I was on edge constantly. I triple checked that I locked my door every time I left my apartment. I took ride chairs to and from work so I wouldn't be walking alone outside. I jumped at every sudden noise or flicker of movement in my peripheral vision. 
At night, the maze nightmare continued to stalk my dreams. I'd wake up screaming, certain my unseen pursuer had finally caught me. The handprint never reappeared on the mirror, but a few times I noticed items in my apartment slightly out of place. A book on a different shelf than I remembered. The coffee mug I swore I had washed in the drying rack. Was I imagining it? Was the stress and lack of sleep pushing me to the edge of paranoia? Or was someone really messing with me? At work, I could barely focus. My performance started slipping. I mixed up numbers, missed deadlines. Mark called me into his office, his face grave. James, I'm concerned about you, he said. You haven't been yourself lately. I let out a strained laugh. I haven't been sleeping well. Nightmares. It's nothing. Mark leaned forward. This is more than a few restless nights. You need to get it together. Beckett and Company is a demanding client, and you're dropping the ball. Don't make me regret putting you on this account. I swallowed hard and nodded. I understand. It won't happen again. But as I left his office, a new fear crept in. Maybe I was cracking up, losing my grip on reality. I needed to get control of myself, of my mind, before I lost everything. That evening, I decided to go for a run to clear my head. I popped in my earbuds and headed to the small park a few blocks from my building. As my feet pounded the pavement, my worries started to recede. The steady rhythm of my breath and heartbeat calmed me. Maybe everything would be okay. Suddenly, a notification pinged on my phone. It was a text message from a number I didn't recognize. I slowed to a walk and read it. You can't escape what's coming for you. An icy chill shot through me. What the hell? Was this some messed up prank? Then I heard a rustling in the bushes behind me. I whipped around. A shadow detached itself from the foliage and raced away through the trees. Someone had been watching me. I ran back to my apartment, adrenaline surging through my veins. Once inside, I searched how to tell if your phone is hacked with trembling fingers. Deep down, I already knew the truth. This wasn't a coincidence. Someone was out to get me, and they could be anyone. The next day, I called in sick to work. I needed answers, and I couldn't get them if I was drowning in spreadsheets and getting chewed out by my boss. I started with my car. I took an Uber to the garage where it had been towed after breaking down. The mechanic came out to talk to me, wiping his greasy hands on a rag. I don't know what to tell you, buddy, he said, shaking his head. Nothing's wrong with it. I stared at him. What? But it wouldn't start. Yeah, that's because your fuel lines were completely empty, bone dry, like someone siphoned out all the gas. My mouth went dry. Another piece of the puzzle clicked into place, forming a disturbing picture. But why would someone do that? I wondered out loud. The mechanic shrugged. You piss anyone off lately? More than I could count, probably. Rival colleagues, disgruntled clients, my ex-girlfriend who I dumped by text message. But none of them seemed like the type to wage a complex campaign of psychological warfare. I needed to dig deeper, uncover the root of all these strange events. I headed to the public library, planning to scour records and databases for any clues about enemies with vendettas against me. But as I walked up the steps, I heard footsteps behind me, a dark figure wearing a hoodie and sunglasses, their face obscured, following me. Hard in my throat, I bolted through the revolving doors into the library. I raced up to the second floor and darted behind a row of shelves, trying to catch my breath. A hand clamped down on my shoulder. I almost screamed. You shouldn't have come here, a low voice said. I spun around to face my assailant, my heart pounding out of my chest. It was my co-worker, Ethan. He was in the cubicle next to mine at the office. We traded pleasantries in the break room, but I didn't know him well. Why was he here? Had he been the one following me? Ethan, what the hell, man? You scared the crap out of me. He glanced furtively from side to side and pulled me deeper into the stacks his grip on my arm uncomfortably tight. Keep your voice down, he hissed. We can't let them hear us. Let who hear us? Fear crept up my spine. Ethan's eyes darted around, never landing on my face for more than a second. He looked downright paranoid. The people who are after you. You've noticed strange things happening, right? Weird coincidences and accidents, like someone's messing with your head? I nodded numbly an icy trickle of dread running through me, so I wasn't imagining it. 
It's all part of their plan, Ethan said. They're trying to drive you crazy, make you doubt yourself, until you crack. Who's they? My mouth was bone dry. Ethan shook his head. I can't say. It's not safe. But you need to watch your back, man. Trust no one. They could be anyone. They've infiltrated every part of your life. With that cryptic warning, he released my arm and vanished into the shadows of the library. I stood there reeling, more lost and afraid than ever. What was going on? Was I the target of some shadowy conspiracy? Or had Ethan lured me here to plant false clues and push me further towards the edge? I didn't know what to believe anymore. Over the next few weeks, my reality unspooled like a cheap sweater. Ethan continued to send me mysterious messages about them, but refused to give me any concrete information. Each note pushed me deeper into a labyrinth of paranoia and terror. At work, my colleagues began treating me differently. Conversations would stop abruptly when I approached. I'd catch people whispering behind my back, darting alarmed glances in my direction. Were they concerned about my deteriorating mental state, or were they in on the sinister plot against me? Even my few friends started pulling away. Texts and calls went unanswered. Invitations to hang out were met with flimsy excuses, like they wanted to distance themselves from me. I started questioning everything and everyone in my life. My boss, my neighbors, the barista who made my daily latte. Any one of them could be a spy, reporting my every move to my hidden enemy. The lack of sleep from the ceaseless nightmares didn't help matters. Reality took on a surreal, hallucinatory quality. I lost chunks of time coming to with no memory of the preceding hours. Phantom sounds and eerie shadows haunted the edges of my awareness. Was I losing my grip? Or was my mind the only thing I could trust? One night, I found a manila envelope shoved under my apartment door. Inside was a stack of surveillance photos. Of me. Me entering and leaving my building, riding the elevator at work, on my laptop at coffee shops, even through the windows of my apartment, unaware I was being watched. Each picture had a date and timestamp. They went back weeks. My hands shook uncontrollably. I'd been monitored, studied, hunted for some time. Icy fear crawled up my spine. But as I flipped through the photos, I noticed something else. Many of them showed me doing things I had no memory of, meeting shady looking people in alleys, typing furiously on my laptop in the middle of the night with a maniacal expression, wandering the streets disheveled and wild-eyed. What did it mean? Had I done those things in my lost time? Or were the images doctored to push me over the brink into madness? With the photos was a note. The key to the truth lies in your dreams. You must go back into the maze. My blood ran cold. My nightmares weren't just nightmares. They were a portal to the truth about what was happening to me. To save myself, I would have to plunge into the dark heart of my fears. I knew what I had to do. Despite every cell in my body screaming not to, I had to return to that nightly labyrinth and confront the terror that dwelled within. That night, I downed a fistful of sleeping pills, laid down in bed, and waited for the darkness to take me. I found myself back in the stone maze, my personal hell. But this time, I didn't run. I forced my leaden feet forward, determined to see this through to the end, even if it destroyed me. The whispering shadows gathered around me, hissing and laughing, feeding on my terror. But I pressed on, rounding corner after corner. There had to be a way out, an escape from this nightmare. You're getting warmer, a sing-song voice called out from the darkness. Follow the sound of my voice, James. I'll lead you to the truth. Ethan? With a shock, I realized the voice was his. Confusion and betrayal stabbed through me. I'd thought he was a friend, a fellow target, but he was a part of this. I staggered onward, pulled toward his taunting voice despite my fury. I had to know the answers. After an eternity, I reached the center of the maze. Ethan stood there, a cruel grin on his face. Welcome to the heart of the labyrinth, James, he said, the place where all of your secrets are buried. What the hell is going on? I demanded. Why are you doing this to me? Ethan laughed, a chilling sound. Oh, James, so blind, even now. You still haven't figured it out? He stepped aside. Behind him was a door, an impossible door standing freely without a wall to anchor it. With a sense of inevitably, I knew what I had to do. 
I reached for the handle, half expecting my hand to pass through it, but it was solid, real. Taking a deep breath, I opened the door and stepped through. I jolted awake with a gasp. Early dawn light filtered through my bedroom window. My face was wet with tears. The dream faded like mist, but one thing remained clear as crystal. I knew what I had to do now. This ended today. I called in sick again, ignoring the clipped disapproval in my manager's voice. Work no longer mattered, none of it did. I had a single goal now, solve the mystery that had become my waking nightmare and excise it from my life like a tumor. I started back at the beginning, my car. If someone had siphoned the gas, they might have left traces behind. Fingerprints, bits of clothing, something. It was a long shot, but I had to try out. I took a ride share to the police station. In the back seat, I rehearsed my story, hoping I sounded credible and not unhinged. I couldn't tell them about the conspiracy or the maze, of course. I'd simply report the vandalism and trust them to follow the clues. The bored-looking desk sergeant took down my information with barely veiled skepticism. I could practically see him writing me off as another paranoid yuppie wasting his time, but he agreed to send a forensics team to dust the car. It was a start. Next, I needed to dig into Ethan. If he was a part of this plot against me, he must have left a trail. No one could cover their tracks that well. I took a cab to the office, my nerves thrumming with anxiety. I hoped Ethan would be out on his usual afternoon coffee run, giving me a chance to rifle through his desk. Luck was with me. His cubicle was empty. I slipped inside and started pulling open drawers, rifling through files. I'm not sure what I was looking for. Proof of his betrayal, his involvement in my torment. I booted up his computer, password protected of course. I tried a few combinations, his birthday, the name of his dog, the university he'd attended. What are you doing, James? I jumped, my heart slamming into my throat. Ethan stood in the entrance to the cubicle, two steaming lattes in hand. His eyes were hard, glittering shards of obsidian. I, I was just, my mind spun, searching for an innocent excuse. Ethan set the coffees down on his desk, every motion precise and controlled, dangerous. Looking for answers in all the wrong places, he said softly. You shouldn't pry into matters you don't understand. I understand enough, I said, my voice trembling with anger and fear. You're a part of what's happening to me. You're trying to destroy me. Ethan smiled, a razor blade of a grin. Destroy you? No, James. I'm trying to set you free. Free from the prison of your own mind. He reached into the drawer. I tensed, expecting a weapon. But he only pulled out a black binder and handed it to me. I think you'll find this enlightening. With that, he picked up the lattes and strode away, leaving me reeling. I flipped open the binder. It was filled with pages of a medical file. My medical file from a psychiatric hospital documenting a complete psychotic break five years ago. None of it was real. It was all in my head. The revelation shattered me. I couldn't trust my own mind, my own memories. Ethan's words echoed in my ears, the prison of my own mind. I fled the office, ignoring the startled looks from my co-workers. I wandered the streets in a daze, the binder clutched to my chest. Was this my true reality? A shattered psyche? A history of madness? I ended up at the park near my apartment the same one where I'd received that ominous text seemingly a lifetime ago. I sat on a bench staring at the ducks paddling serenely across the pond. Despair crushed down on me. If I couldn't trust my perceptions, my instincts, then what could I trust? I'd been so certain that I was the victim of a malevolent conspiracy. What if I was just a garden variety schizophrenic, my mind populating the world with illusory threats and delusional connections? A hand fell on my shoulder. I flinched violently, whipping my head around. Ethan peered down at me, his smile sympathetic. It's a hard truth to face, he said gently, sitting down beside me, that the reality you believed in was a construct of a disordered mind, but I want to help you, James. Why? I couldn't keep the raw anguish from my voice. Why did you let me suffer for so long? Why not just tell me the truth? Ethan sighed. You weren't ready to accept it. You were too mired in your paranoid fantasies. I had to let you chase them to their inevitable dead end. Only then, with your delusions crumbling around you, 
Would you be open to the real story? It made a sick, twisted kind of sense. My therapist, my confidant, guiding me through an accelerated breakdown to a moment of clarity. The crushing weight of the truth bore down on me. My life, my very self, was a lie, an illusion. I put my head in my hands and wept. Ethan brought me back to the psych ward, the place I had escaped from, the place my healing had to begin. I entered in a near catatonic state, unresisting as he signed me in, and watched the nurses lead me away. Everything I thought I knew had been ripped away. My identity, my world, had been revealed as a fantasy, a delusional construct to protect me from a reality too horrible to face. I had lost myself in a labyrinth of my own making. In my small, sterile room, I sank onto the bare mattress and stared at the wall. Snippets of memory flashed through my mind, the endless maze of my nightmares, the shadowy man trailing me through the stacks the strange, disjointed photos that hinted at a second, secret life. Were they real? Hallucinations? Metaphors and symbols generated by a broken psyche? I could no longer tell the difference. I squeezed my eyes shut, hot tears leaking from the corners. I had never felt so alone, so hopeless. I was shattered into pieces, and I didn't know how to rebuild myself. As I slipped into sleep, one thought crystallized in my mind with piercing clarity. For my entire life, I had been my own worst enemy, the monster hunting me through a twisting maze of self-deception. I was both the pursued and the pursuer, and there could be no escape until I killed the shadow self that haunted me. One of us would not survive the night. I opened my eyes to that familiar, hated darkness. The corridors of stone stretched out before me, an impossible, ever-changing configuration. The air pressed close around me thick with the clammy stench of fear. The nightmare that had become my reality, or perhaps it was the other way around. In this moment, on this threshold, the distinction ceased to matter. I called out to the shadows, my voice raw and ragged, show yourself, I'm done running. Laughter rolled through the darkness, mocking, triumphant. A figure stepped forward, separating from the restless horde of shades, my breath caught in my throat. It was me, a perfect mirror image, from the dark hair to the sharp lines of the jaw to the blue eyes that burned with madness. But the expression was one I had never seen on my own face before. Cunning, cruel, feral. The face of the enemy that had haunted my steps for so long. Welcome home, my doppelganger said, spreading his arms wide. I've been waiting for you. Who are you, I demanded, my hands balling into fists. He smiled, a predator's grin. I'm you, James, the real you. The one you locked away because you were too weak to embrace your true nature. I shook my head in desperate denial. No, you're just a delusion, a symptom of my madness. Madness? He threw back his head and laughed. Is that what the good doctor told you? That I'm nothing more than a figment of your disordered mind? He stepped closer, his eyes glittering with malice. I am your shadow self, your dark twin. Every violent impulse, every twisted desire you've ever repressed and denied, I've always been with you, whispering in your ear. I recoiled in revulsion, in dread, but some part of me, the broken part, thrilled to his words, recognized the truth in them. All your life you've been running from me, the other James said, locking me in a cage of lies and medicated numbness, but you can never escape your own soul. I've been bleeding through, taking control bit by bit, those blank spaces in your memory? That was me, reveling in the darkness. He grinned savagely. There's only room for one of us in this head, James. And it's time for you to give me what's mine. He lunged at me, hands curled into claws. I stumbled back, raising my arms to defend myself. We grappled in the narrow passageway, snarling like animals. It wasn't a battle of flesh and blood, but of will and sanity, light and shadow. The self I believed myself to be pitted against the self I feared. We were evenly matched, spinning through the corridors in a dance of violence, but I was fueled by desperation, by the knowledge of what I would become if I lost. I couldn't let him win. I couldn't let the monster inside consume me. With a howl of anguish and fury, I slammed my doppelganger against the stone wall, wrapped my hands around his throat, squeezed. His eyes bulged in shock, in outrage, but I didn't relent. I couldn't. This ended now. 
The life faded from his eyes, the struggles of his body weakening and then ceasing. He vanished, dissolving into shadow. But as he died, I felt a part of myself die too. The part of my psyche that he had occupied, the repressed primitive corners of my soul withered to ash and blew away. I crumpled to the ground, shaking with sobs, but they were tears of relief, of liberation, not despair. The maze, the metaphorical prison of my fractured mind, began to crumble around me. The darkness receded. For the first time in longer than I could remember, I saw light. I opened my eyes, blinking in the pale morning sun slanting through the window. For a moment, I didn't know where I was. The institutional green walls, the neatly made bed, were unfamiliar. Then it all came rushing back, the psych ward, my complete break with my constructed reality, my confrontation with my dark mirror in the realm of dream and delusion. I sat up slowly, taking inventory of myself. I felt hollowed out, scraped raw. The foundations of my psyche had been ripped out, and I wasn't sure yet what would grow in their place. But for the first time in years, my mind was quiet. The whispers that had haunted me for so long were silenced. A soft knock on the door made me turn my head. Ethan poked his head in, his smile tentative. How are you feeling this morning, James? I opened my mouth, closed it again. How could I possibly put into words in the ordeal of the night, the shattering and rebuilding of my inner world? I, I don't know, I answered honestly. Everything feels different. I feel different, like I've woken up from a long, long dream. Ethan nodded. Breakthroughs often feel that way, he said, disorienting, raw. It takes time to process, to find your equilibrium in the new reality. He entered the room and sat beside me on the bed, studying my face. But I can already see the change in you, he said softly. The shadow behind your eyes is gone. You confronted your demons and emerged victorious. I wanted to believe him, but doubt still coiled in my gut. What if it's just another level of delusion? I asked, hating the tremor in my voice. Another maze with no escape. Ethan rested a hand on my shoulder, his touch grounding me. There are no guarantees in the landscape of the mind, he said. But I believe in you, James. You have a strength. You haven't even begun to tap yet. He rose and held out a hand to me. This isn't the end of your healing, he said. It's the beginning. I'll be with you every step if you'll let me. I hesitated only a moment before reaching out and grasping his hand. I didn't know what the future held, what challenges and pitfalls I would have to navigate in my recovery. But I knew I couldn't stay trapped in the labyrinth of my own nightmares any longer. It was time to stop running from the uncomfortable truths of my psyche. Time to step into the light, however uncertain and unfamiliar it might be. I stood on shaky legs and let Ethan guide me out of the room, out of the ward, out of the prison of my own making and into the wide waiting world. The monsters were slain. A new story was waiting to be written. And for the first time in many years, I look forward to turning the page.